Aloha and welcome to Tough Love with Loretta Chen, where Hawaii's change makers talk tough on the island they love. Our first guest for the inaugural episode was born in Kauai, raised on Oahu, and is a public interest attorney. She was formerly a therapeutic foster parent, was elected to the Board of Education, where she served not one, but two terms. She was appointed to the Civil Rights Commission and currently serves on the boards of ACLU Hawaii and Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action. She's also the business owner of Affordable Quality Apartment Rentals, President of the Iwamoto Family Foundation, maybe now it's beginning to sound familiar. Can you guess? She's also <laughs> recognized as a champion of change, woo, by President Barack Obama in 2013. I mean, not just done yet, just last year, Newsweek listed her as one of 50 need to know pioneers for LGBTQ rights. I am a total fangirl. I want to sign up for your fan club. <laughs> Please welcome. Kim Coco Iwamoto. Thank you so much, Loretta. <laughs> I really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this inaugural experience with you. Yeah, thank you so yeah, much for being a member. Congratulations. Oh, thank so you. So how did you um, come to this point to do this show? Uh, actually, you know, thank you for asking. I mean, I, I, I'm new to the island. I moved here 2015. Uh, and I decided that it's either I could just stay home and just twiddle my thumbs and then not really know the island ever. But right. I could put myself out there, get to know people, get to know strong, independent uh, women, men alike. Uh, and one of the things that I did was uh, I threw myself into a project where I started to write a book. That's right. That's and amazing. Right. So congratulations. Uh, it's just you having a launch party on November 1st. 1st. That's right. You're coming, right? So, yes, I yeah. am. Okay. Thank Everyone you. Hears. I already You're got coming. my ticket. It's Inspiring <laughs> Women of Hawaii. That's Thank right. Thank you for doing this. I started reading some of the blurbs from it, and it's amazing. It's oh, so many, I, know, I feel like I know Half of the women in this book. I'm sure you do. And uh, and there's and it's so great to to get to know them in a more intimate, deeper way. Yeah. And they really opened up to you, and it's a yeah. testament to how I think comfortable oh, you make people you. feel. And oh, yeah. that's how I felt when you. Uh, that's right. So it's a perfect that. segue for me to say that one of the 24 women that we highlighted is obviously Kim Koko Iwamoto. And I had this amazing conversation with you. I remember going to your home and you just open up your home and, and, and your life to me and share it with me a life story. So I just feel like you're one of those people that I truly admire and respect because you speak truth to power. You would tell the emperor or empress he or she has no clothes. <laughs> As you would tell me as well, if I mess up and just go ahead. No, <laughs> but yes, please do. But but let's get right to. Oh, but you know what? Let me just ask you. I saw these fabulous pictures of you oh. at Pride Parade right. last weekend. Yes. Right? So I was so honored to be to serve as Grand Marshal of the um, Honolulu Pride Parade wow. that took place here in Waikiki um, last uh, Saturday. Wow. Um, so thank you very much to the LGBT. Legacy Foundation mm. for bestowing that honor onto me and for all of the hundreds of volunteer hours um, and uh, the resource dollars that it takes to make um, that kind of community event happen. Yeah. Um, and I think you saw in the picture that one yeah. of the sponsors was Bank of Hawaii okay. and they let me um, kind of nestle into their contingent. Um, it was, they had a lot of great energy right. and we'll talk more about them um, in, in the program, I right. think. Right. And also, I mean, you are our first guest, and, and you are integral to, I mean, it's just my psyche, my, my, my thought process was, I'm an outsider, I'll always have, I'll always live in this liminal gray space, the insider, outsider. And for me to get to know the islands better, I also wanted to ask some tough questions, right? right. And, and that's why I brought you in, because I feel like you would speak truth to power, and we chatted on the phone while actually we were texting, and you shared there were couple of issues that, that bug you, your, your three big bug bears that we're going to talk <laughs> well, about. Well, actually, so what, the way I kind of interpreted your, um, you're kind of putting a topic out there, mm. I thought, what are three issues that people aren't really That's comfortable right. talking about? That's right. Um, that, you know, that they're not comfortable articulating yeah. or challenging. And so, yeah, those three issues for me were um, paying a living wage, mm -hmm. specifically in the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. um, also, um, you know, I, um, I, I recently became a mom like four years ago. Yeah. And so I had to deal with vaccinations. Um, and so looking more into what's um, the mandatory vaccination schedule. Mm. So that's my daughter um, and I, my daughter Rory. Oh. And so, you know, I had to um, navigate the whole, the, her health requirements right. for sure. school, et cetera. Yeah. And then finally, I wanted to speak about um, a little bit about 
the um, the layers of racism mm. involved in the way people are responding to Native Hawaiians, Kanaka Maoli, um, protecting um, their land and their culture. Right. So let's get right into it. I mean, you, you shared that one of the things you really want to talk about was the hypo crisis of paying poverty wages, right? That's right. While addressing poverty in Hawaii. Let's <laughs> just right. let's jump right in. Yes. So um, I mentioned Bank of Hawaii yeah. was a sponsor for Pride. They also were a sponsor for the Aloha United Way's mm -hmm. um, Alice Report, mm -hmm. which basically looked at um, families in Hawaii mm -hmm. and how many of them are living paycheck to paycheck right. and really what is the true minimum wage they can earn in order to survive because as you know Hawaii has the highest rates of homelessness in yeah. the nation yeah. so how is that happening right. um, and so obviously if you're not getting paid a, a survival wage right. you end up potentially in That's the right. streets, That's right? right? Yeah. So the Alice Report basically identified, and this was done two years ago, so it's right. a little dated, so mm -hmm. um, it was $14.06 an hour. Right. Hawaii's minimum wage right now is $10.10. So I've been working with other community members um, to get the minimum wage in Hawaii raised. Right. Um, I personally, given all the studies from MIT, mm -hmm. um, our current um, trajectory of cost of living, right. in Five years, because the way minimum raises, minimum wage re increases usually roll in, uh, roll up over time. Right. So I'm going for 22 personally right. an yes. hour. Mm -hmm. That's what I think people need to survive in five years. Sure. Um, other people are going for 17. Yep. Right now in front of the ledge, I think the, the bill that hopefully will pass or could pass right. is $15 an hour, right. which would put many families above the survival wage right. identified through the Alice Report. Yeah. And again, you can look at the Alice Report by going to the Aloha United Way right. website and they have the report, they have synopses. But you know, back to when I was on the Board of Education. Right. So this problem of shortchanging and not looking at true costs right. of delivering services, yeah. especially social services like education, yeah. mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, services around mental health, yes. services for the homeless, uh, services that affect families, a lot of times we don't represent the true cost to right. funders. Yeah. And so in the case of public education, the Department of Education puts their budget together right. and then they deliver it to the Board of Education yeah. and then we approve it and we send it on to the legislature. Right. So in Hawaii, um, the legislature is the only body that funds educate public education. So when I served on the board, I yeah. asked the superintendent, is this a true cost? Is this right. really how much it costs to deliver quality education in Hawaii? Right. They said, no, this budget's put together based on how much we think we can get from the ledge. Wow. I'm like, well, then yeah. you're just feeding into the That's dysfunction. Right. That's right. Because I was surprised to learn, I mean, from, mm -hmm. you know, from, from these reports and from you too, that the, the DOE full-time employees are paid so little that their kids qualify for free and reduced yes. lunch. I mean, that breaks my I heart. Ask, I mean, right. I'm an educator. It really breaks my heart. It does. I mean, yeah. it's not, okay, and it's, we're not speaking actually about educators specifically. Exactly. But the DOE system, the system. includes, you know, um, custodians, That's right. technicians, yes. education assistants. Yeah. So it includes a lot of people. But yes, there are indeed, and I did verify this with the superintendent of mm. schools at the time, mm that indeed there are full-time employees of the DOE yeah. whose own kids qualify for free and reduced lunch. Yeah. Basically, the state is, is participating in perpetuating poverty that's right. within our state. And I don't think that's the right. Yeah. So let me just jump in and ask you, um, I mean, you said that right now you're, you're working to try and raise it to 22. Well, right. I mean, I'm advocating for 22, right. understanding that. Exactly. So, so where, what does it look like? I mean... Well, right now, a bill almost made it through okay. this last year for $15 right. an hour, but yeah. then there was some legal shenanigans that happened, right. um, or technical shenanigans that happened that right. kind of um, killed the bill. And so, but it, there is an opportunity to bring it back. And I have to say, ironically, even though the legislature killed this minimum wage bill, yeah. they gave themselves a raise. <sighs> yes, they raised their minimum wage. And I talk about their yeah. salaries as a minimum wage also. Yes. Because no matter how little bit of work right. the representative might do, right. uh, they can just like show up to half the meetings. Right. They, they can do very little in their community, right. and they would still get paid the same amount. Right. You know, they, I mean, so it's really a slap in the face That's to right. all the families who are paying their salaries, that's right. giving them a raise that's right. while they're struggling. That's and right. so that's why we, the community is really mm. uh, rallying together on this issue. 
But on the other side to that, one of the pushback I, I heard was mm. from the nonprofit sector. Right. And this is why I wanted to address them head on. Yes. So myself and Tanya, um, my friend Tanya Yamanaka from Hilo, we coordinated um, a panel at right. the HANO conference. Mm -hmm. Um, and HANO is a Hawaii Alliance for Nonprofit Organizations, right. and their director, Lisa, was uh, kind enough to let us uh, put this panel together, sure. and we invited people from the nonprofit sector, people who do fundraising, mm. and also grant makers were right. part of our panel. Yeah. And of course, the audience was full of nonprofit um, board members, directors, right. and staff. Right. And so we're able to really speak about the options and solutions right. that are out there. So that you met us, you actually some, set a policy mm -hmm. to pay a living wage? Was, 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 was anything achieved? No, so what's the challenge is that, you know, a lot of the um, nonprofits, I think there's nonprofits who get state funding, right? right? They, who, they have state contracts. Mm -hmm. And there are nonprofits that do mostly um, fundraising right. through personal or grant foundations, et right. cetera. And what we heard from one of the foundations, mm. and for myself as, mm. as a, running the Umoto Family Foundation, right. we do not um, penalize applicants just because they're paying a living wage. Right. We do not think, oh, you're being wasteful with our money. Mm. Especially, mm. and I think mm. I really mm. challenge those nonprofit organizations mm. that have any kind of mission statement um, that indicates that they are really there to uplift their That's communities right. yeah. with the economic aspect. And if those organizations themselves are paying poverty wages, that's right. You know, you the can't achieve your mission by right. perpetuating the problem you're trying to solve. Yes. I think that's a problem, yeah. and I think they need to um, own up to that yeah. responsibility. Yeah. Again, one of the problems is that um, mm -hmm. just like the DOE, yeah. not asking for true costs from the legislature. Yeah. A lot of nonprofits are doing that too. They're they're submitting bids mm. to get contracts that um, that are way too low, that right. don't really say this is how much it costs, yeah. and they're underbidding each other, right. and that's a problem. Um, so there, like a that bit needs to the to, floor. But yeah. I have to say that, you know, um, my family's business um, is Robert's Hawaii Tours, and now it's employee-owned, mm. but they have government contracts, right, right. with student transportation. Right. They do not ask permission right. from the state yeah. to pay people um, the salaries they need to pay. That's right. If there's a shortage of bus drivers, right. then you gotta pay wages to recruit them yeah. to work for your company so that you can fulfill the contracts That's right. to bus the students to school. Right. You yeah. gotta pay those wages, whatever they are. That's right. And so and those companies are still making a profit. That's right. So the nonprofit sector should not feel like it should pay poverty wages. Right just because they're delivering a good a good service. That's right. I'm, I'm, I'm with you 100%. Uh, but, but for now, we are going to go for a, a break uh, okay. pretty soon. And then when we come back, we're going to yes. speak to Kim Coco. And this time, we're going to uh, talk about her being a mother and okay. how that's like being mother to worry. And of course, sure. segue to her other very, uh, topic that she's very passionate about, which is on mandatory vaccinations. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Rusty Kamori, host of Beyond the Lines. I was the head coach for the Punahou Boys varsity tennis team for 22 years, and we we're fortunate to win 22 consecutive state championships. This show is based on my book, which is also titled Beyond the Lines, and it's about leadership, creating a superior culture of excellence, achieving and sustaining success, and finding greatness. If you're a student, parent, sports or business person, and want to improve your life and the lives of people around you, Tune in and join me on Mondays at 11 a.m. as we go beyond the lines on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Aloha. I'm Keisha King, host of At the Crossroads, where we have conversations that are real and relevant. We have spoken with community leaders from right here locally in Hawaii and all around the world. Won't you join us on thinktechhawaii.com or on YouTube on the ThinkTech Hawaii channel. Our conversations are real, relevant, and lots of fun. I'll see you at the crossroads. Aloha. Hi there, and you're watching 
Tic Tac and it's Tough Love with Loretta Chen. Of course, we have our studio guest today, and it's Kin Coco Iwamoto. And uh, right now, I'm going to segue and um, ask something about Kim Coco. I went to her home, and I saw that not only is she a, a businesswoman, she's a legislator, she's a huge advocate, but now she is a mother. It was so Ooh. nice to see this other side of you, just so paternal and, and oh. so loving. So, so thank you. I just want to correct I'm not a legislator, and I've not worked at the legislature. Right. I've only been there as a citizen activist. Okay. Um, it was the Board of Education that right. I was elected to. Okay. Yeah, so yes, thank you for, um, yeah, I love being a mom. Yeah. Rory is great. I feel like we're destined to be in each other's lives. Yeah. Um, so it's so wonderful. And so with that, love comes responsibility, yeah. right, for her health care, for her wellness and well-being. Um, so in, in, I never really considered vaccinations. I know for myself, if I don't have to get a flu vaccine or I can avoid getting vaccines, mm. I do, I spend, I invest a lot in homeopathic right. in chiropractic, you know, in a lot of different alternative health yeah. to just keep my immune system mm -hmm. strong. Um, so I never really thought about vaccinations until um, for my daughter right. enrolling her in school, etc. Right. So then I started following this. So the changes that are going on in Hawaii mm. around um, the expansion of different vaccinations that are being required right. um, by our state. And I have to say, I just want to contextualize what I'm about to say as I've always been pro-choice. I'm a huge and longtime sure. supporter of Planned Parenthood. Right. I believe that women and all people mm -hmm. should have autonomy and agency to, you know, with, you know, to seek counsel from the physician, right. but ultimately to make decisions about their own bodies. Right. What's going in their bodies, what's right. coming out of their bodies. Right. You know, that they should have informed, they should be educated, um, be given alternatives, and then being given access. Right. Um, so in viewing the requirements and the mandates around vaccinations right. of our children, right. I, I think about it with that lens mm. of being pro-choice, right. pro-informed. And right. if people choose to get, great, I actually think, because I also believe in Medicare for All, yeah. I believe vaccinations should be free to everyone yeah. if you choose to have it. If yeah. that's what you're choosing, yeah, completely. then, you know, I'm not saying, so I'm not anti right. this you know, medical intervention for people, sure. that's for you. Yeah. But my problem comes with the mandate. And one of the things that's really problematic mm. is kids can be kept out of school. Right. Public school, private school, oftentimes daycare programs, you can be kept out. And what, one of the reasons why I find that really interesting mm. is because during the 90s, mm. um, there was a Ryan White Act. Right. Ryan White was a teenager who was hard from attending his school yep. because he was HIV positive. Right. So, you know, that was, people said that's really unfair. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of stigma attached yeah, absolutely. and it's not based in anything. So they let somebody with, you know, H so the, the Congress mm -hmm. passed this act mm -hmm. that said that schools and school districts cannot, and states mm -hmm. cannot discriminate against mm -hmm. an individual for mm -hmm. being HIV positive. Right. So one of the things that's really interesting though is that the state now can ban kids from school for not being vaccinated, let's say. Sure. Let's say if it's HIV, but now really right. the issue has come up, it's HPV right. is the issue. Right. So you can be banned from school for, for, being, for not getting vaccinated. Right. But if you were HPV positive, right. you would be allowed to stay in school. Right. So it's this very interesting sure. um, contradiction, sure. hypocrisy. Yep. On one hand, we value education. Yep. And then also, I come from a civil rights perspective, which sure. is, is the sta state acting in the least restrictive, least invasive way? Sure. Are there other ways to protect, um, to do a public health kind of model sure. around um, disease and the way diseases are spread? Right. Um, one of the things I, I think about is um, the fact that when I travel to some countries, mm. um, they have therm thermometers, right. basically laser yeah. thermometers pointed mm -hmm. at every single yeah. person getting off the plane yeah. or entering their mm -hmm. country. That's right. So then if there's an active virus in them sure. or like something's going on, they can it's kind effective. of mm -hmm. put them to the side That's and right. let them get better. Mm -hmm. um, but for Hawaii, we have like 1.4 million right. people. Mm -hmm. We have 10 million tourists a year. Right. So this concept that I learned about herd immunity, right. the idea of you want to vaccinate the herd right. and to a certain degree so that you protect it. Yep. Our herd it doesn't have, it will never be able to get that because of the 10 million right. tourists that That's we never, we don't require vaccines from them. Yep. We don't uh, thermograph right. or thermoscope. I don't right. know that word, but we yep. don't take their temperatures. Yeah. 
We don't do a lot of these things to prevent them yeah. from contaminating or hurt. So why would we inject something? And here's the other part to right. this that I've been studying. Um, as an attorney, you learn about liability, product right. liability. Right. That is something that keeps manufacturers on their A game, right? right? So whether you build a car, anything, sure. everything has liability yep. because you want to make sure that the consumer is protected. Yep. Vaccinations have mm. been exempt from liability, right. 100% exempt. Yep. Congress passed the Vaccination Act, which said any producer of vaccinations, we don't care if it's ineffective. Mm. We don't care if you made that vaccine in a factory right. in a country that is known to have mm -hmm. horrible compliance and reliability rates. Um, a lot of the vaccines are being made in countries right. where, I mean, there's no consequence right. for doing a bad job. Right. So that let me ask you two me. questions then. So let me ask you two questions then. So the first question is, do you think uh -huh. that instead of having mandatory vaccination, the question or, or, or we should then place the responsibility on the pharmaceutical companies, right, to, to force them towards having to say, you need to be more transparent of how these vaccines are made? Is it a matter of communication? Or, mm -hmm. and then let me play devil's advocate because I, I, I hear yeah. you. Uh, but do you also think that if we have more unvaccinated individuals in a community, do you right. think that this will bring also higher risk or potential of acquiring um, vaccine-preventable diseases? So, I mean, it's two questions. Right. But, yeah. And which base, which your questions, what I heard, right. were based on a lot of assumptions. That's right. Right. And um, I think it's going to take a lot of time to, to, unpack, to all unpack all of those assumptions. Yeah. But what I'm trying to say is, for myself and some other people, the challenge is, I want to be informed. And yeah, if you read sure. the inserts, you know, every medication you get has an insert. Yeah. And yes, in the insert, it says may cause injury or death. Right. I mean, at least they're open right. <laughs> about that. I know. It's like when you watch those uh, drug ads, right? It's like uh, on, on TV. Yeah. It's like half the ad, three quarters of the ad is to tell you what, what are yeah, all yeah. The, the side effects. Right. right. But for a lot of parents, and I learned this because, you know, yeah. so she, parent, my, my daughter did get vaccinated right. to get into her school because yeah. I wasn't knowledgeable about it at the time. And yeah, I was never told that all of the side effects that totally. she could befall her. Yeah, You're uh, right. and then and since then I've been speaking with other parents, and also the doctor, the pediatrician has a duty to report That's when right. there is a vaccine injury. Yeah. Um, but even then, there's a report. pressure for them not to report. Yeah. Here's another thing. Yeah. Um, pediatricians are given a financial payout right. if their patients get vaccinated on time. That's right. Um, and you can look at it opposite. Right. They get a they get a deduction. They get withheld money. That's right. So they get an incentive for so vaccinating. So there's a financial incentive. There is there's a financial basically incentive. basically a third party. That's right. The, the insurance company mm -hmm. is now manipulating my the pediatrician mm -hmm. and the system to say what kind of treatment my child's going to get. That's right. Where, what other situation will, would we allow that kind of mm. interference? Right. It's really shocking to me from a consumer advocate point of view mm -hmm. that we would do that. So you have no choice, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, or, or you I can't mean, make no, there's this financial choice. pressure. Yes, of course. So actually, my physician was saying, oh, yeah, you know, came up in, in a discussion mm -hmm. um, that maybe we should, her office should just eject all the families who are questioning right. vaccinations because it may um, impact her overhead, her, wow. her ability to meet her running an office costs. Wow. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like exactly. there's, there's a lot of craziness going on. And what we do know, and we're in this, in this whole debate around opi opioid addiction right. and right. the consequences of the pharmaceutical companies, yeah. what we've learned is that pharmaceutical companies are by far like four times more invested in lobbying That's right. and, and, and making contributions to politicians yeah. than any other sector, including guns, prisons, um, defense, weaponry, yeah. all of that stuff. They, pharmaceuticals pay way more. That's right. But you know, I, we only have a couple more minutes left, but I also really mm -hmm. wanted to quickly ask you this question because I know it's so important to yeah. you too. The one of the things that you're really passionate about is also um, this issue of the Aloha Aina movement. Because yes. in our, one of our conversations, I mean, you raised the fact that you see racist responses to Aina protectors in the Aloha Aina yes. movement. Yes, and one of the big flags for me is yeah. I compare the protection of conservation lands yeah. Um, different um, different actions that have right. happened here in Hawaii. One of them being in Manoa Valley. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, Hiko, the electric company, wanted to put these 108 foot um, towers along the Waihila Wai Ridge right. um, in order to carry the power lines on the ridge line. Yeah. So here's Manoa Valley, mm -hmm. and here's the ridge, St. Louis Heights Ridge. Right. Um, so it would have gone up around University of Hawaii and then up towards uh, the peaks. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so they wanted to do that, and the community 
were mostly um, Japanese families, Chinese families, right. white families, and the Hawaiians that were there were Hawaiian missionary families. Right. But all of them were, you know, saying, no, do not put these, it will ruin our sight lines as mm. conservation. And they got their way. And, and they stopped it. Right. And they Nobody, got their way. Mm -hmm. no one said, oh, please, you know, that you're just trying to stop development. Right. You're anti-electricity. That's right. Hey, you're anti-energy. Right. You know, like, no one said that. Right. So when people actually turn to the Hawaiians for protecting Conservation right. land that happens to, to be sacred you're, you're, to them. You're anti-science. Suddenly, yeah. they're, they're being framed as anti-science. You're anti-science. Mm -hmm. Anti-progress. And, and one of the and reasons we hear that is mm -hmm. when somebody goes, "Oh no, I support the Team T because mm -hmm. I believe in science." Mm -hmm. That is what they're saying. They're basically right. saying this group is anti-science, right. and that in that is embedded a degree of racism right. that I feel like people need to own yes. and recognize. Yes. And that's basically what I wanted to share. Yeah. You know. Yeah. No, no, I, I, I'm with you 100%. And that's why I think, you know, for, for our very first program, I really want to, to bring you in because I feel like you, you speak truth to power and you aren't afraid to bring up the issues that people need to hear or, or issues that people are too afraid to talk about. Because, I mean, one of the things that I've noticed um, having moved here uh, as a Singaporean um, is that people are, are really gentle and really courteous and really nice, you know, and sometimes <laughs> in that, which I love, and that's why I moved here, but in that graciousness, sometimes we circumvent issues or conversations right. that we need to have. Yes. Right? I agree. So I do, I'm willing to take bold risk to put myself out there and make people will not agree with me. Yeah. Um, and that's okay. And, you know, people may share more information with me and it might change my yeah. opinion on things right. or expand. Right. Um, and I'm open to that. That's I'm right. not afraid of that. That's right. You're not afraid of tough love. <laughs> You're not afraid of tough love. And uh, so... Um, also, I mean, since, since we're wrapping up the show too, like quite quickly, I also really wanted to share that uh, one of the things that uh, you also shared um, uh, in the book, right, is that you are never afraid to speak up for, for you never want to do the work of the oppressor. That's and that's one right. of the things that stuck with me. You never want to do the work of the oppressor. So whatever you do, you always want to, whether when we have privilege of, of uh, income, uh, you want to help. If you have privilege of race, you want to have that conversation. If you have privilege right. of, and you're able to, it's like you play shifting roles and you're able to see privilege. And right. you're able, and you recognize that privilege is not stagnant. And you're able to play yes. these very different roles and put on different hats, which I think is what we must have. Yes. And have these conversations, especially in the 21st century, where everything is, 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 is we're, at a, we're, at, we're at an intersection. All of these issues need, and we need to have these important uh, conversations. Yeah, yeah. and it's also don't do the work of the oppressor. It has don't to do, do with it. the inner voice, That's too. That's right. Your inner voice. Do not listen to the words that put you down and That's people's right. remarks. Don't internalize that. And those are just the words we need to hear on <laughs> Thursday and the rest <laughs> of the week, really. So if you want to find out more about Kim Coco, we'll find out more about her um, and that wonderful book. Uh, shamelessly plugging my own book. Yes. It's Mutual Publishing's a new book, Inspiring Women of Hawaii, and it's out now to all major bookstores, Costco, Target, Amazon. And also join us for a public launch at Barnes & Noble AMC Ala Moana Center, November 15, 6 p.m. And all proceeds on the day of the events go towards the YWCA, and regular sales of the books go towards the Women of Wai'anae Scholarship Oh, so, mm -hmm. so please support inspiring women of Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you all so much. Thank you for watching Tough Love with Laura Chan because you know what? Tough times don't last, but tough people do. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Loretta. Thank you. Bye.